Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome you all for the today's morning session. I would like to welcome Dr. Barney, uh, sir, for coming for this morning session. Uh, we had already had uh, one session last time, and this is a continuation of the last session. Uh, the treatment, the role of steroids in ILD uh, will be covered in this session. Thank you so much, sir. Welcome you to this. The last talk, which was on predominantly focused on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, in this talk, we will focus on the role of steroids in interstitial lung dis diseases. We'll just recap few things uh, on the flowchart of the classification which we uh, decided last time. Uh, so the overview of my talk uh, is as given here. We look at the classification, the main processes in uh, DPLD and equivalence on HRCT. Steroid responsive ILDs versus where steroid is not required. Factors which affect the dose and duration of steroids. Uh, and we look at the role of steroids in five specific instances uh, of uh, DPLD where it is uh, most used. Uh, we look at the treatment approach of steroids. We look at uh, the ancillary treatment required. How do we monitor? And uh, uh, we'll keep the identification of PPF and uh, role of antifibrotics for the next talk. Idiopathic interstitial pneumonias uh, are a very specific group in which the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the prototype. So if you want to further differentiate IIP, you can call it IPF and non-IPF because there are some behavioral differences between the prototype and the rest which we need to understand. Again, that part of it was dealt with more in my first talk. Now, the IIPs also by uh, latest classifications are classified into major ILDs, IIPs, smoking-related IIPs, and acute IIPs. So, now if you look at the cardinal symptom of uh, ILD, it is cough and breathlessness which are progressive for more than three months duration. It is in that clinical scenario that you would suspect an ILD. Then you would go on to look at, you know, clinical findings which fit into ILD, which may be uh, some crackles, which are usually bibasal, velcro, end inspiratory. There, in, there are clubbings of varied proportion in different of these diseases. Then you make a clinical suspicion of ILD. Then you go on to, again, these are, I'm just recapping some bits of what we did last uh, lecture. You go ahead and evaluate. Evaluation includes evaluation of etiology because you need to rule that out to call it IIP. And it is to look at the pattern on imaging, which is HRCT, which is the gold standard. And then you have severity um, uh, assessment based on lung function and exercise physiology. We, we looked at that. We will be looking at that when I talk about monitoring here as well. Now, uh, once you've done this, it is uh, very important to understand what is the gold standard for diagnosis of ILD? Hmm? I think only, only a couple of you were there last time. So what is the gold standard for ILD diagnosis? I try to stress, stress to the extent possible. Others can also reply. What is it? What is the gold standard? Biopsy is the global standard? Yeah, in, s well, no. <laughs> yeah, multidisciplinary discussion. So sometimes, see, that's what, sometimes your clinical radiological picture and your HRCT is enough. Sometimes you need the clinical radiological picture, HRCT, and a bronchoalveolar lavage differential count. You will realize that as we go into some aspects today. And then you have um, a clinical radiological picture, a HRCT, a bronchial alveolar lavage, and a transbronchial lung biopsy. Then that is not enough in some situations, and you need a what was earlier uh, um, propagated as open lung biopsy or a surgical lung biopsy. And no, now we have new uh, bronchoscopic technique called transbronchial cryobiopsy, where we freeze the lung with a carbon dioxide uh, uh, gas, liquid to gas interface to minus 60 degrees and remove a large chunk of tissue. 
which is equivalent to a surgical lung biopsy. So you may require a clinical radiological picture, a ball, and the transbronchial cryo lung biopsy to make a diagnosis. Now, who decides what of these is required for which? That decision is a bit complex. So, both the decision of what is required when, except for certain uh, standard principles that we follow, and the final diagnosis which needs to bring in the clinical radiological picture, the BAL where appropriate, uh, TBLB where appropriate, a TBLC which is the cryo lung biopsy where appropriate, the histopathology and the final output is through a ILD MDD which is a multidisciplinary discussion which ideally needs to be formal. So in our institution we have a twice a week ILD MDD, whoever has come to our department will know, it's a two hour intense uh, session where uh, one of our registrars has a PowerPoint slide for each patient that is presented. Then the radiologists give their uh, interpretation, the pathologists give their interpretation, and we finalize the diagnosis and treatment plan. So the ILD MDT is the gold standard for diagnosing all MDTs. So that is very important to know. Now what we are trying to understand is the role of each of this in the diagnosis of ILD and well, so that you have a broad idea as to where what is required in terms of diagnosis and in terms of treatment. So, so if you have a, uh, the major ILDs are further divided into chronic fibrosing, where I IPF is the prototype, then you have NSIP, which is non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. And non-specific interstitial pneumonitis is, uh, can be, is, it's a spectrum. You know, as I tell you, the two main processes you will understand that you can have just inflammation going on, you can have a mix of inflammation and fibrosis going on, or you can be, have just fibrosis going on, but not fitting into clinical radiological criteria of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which we delved into detail in the last lecture. I think that's available on YouTube, so for those of you not understanding that, please go into that and look at that. So, if it doesn't fit into IPF, the closest differential is a fibrotic NSIP, that is fibrosis is the process. Then the other end of the spectrum, if you, ha you have what is called a cellular NSIP, where it is predominant inflammation, and you can have a mix of fibrosis and inflammation when it is called a mixed NSIP. Now, these terminologies and understanding is important, because as I, you may have gathered, at one end we give steroids and at the other end we give antifibrotics. So that is non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. And often when I was a PG, I used to understand it as non-specific means it is something that is a waste paper basket. It's not so, it's a specific entity. The waste paper basket or what we don't understand what it is, is the unclassified ILD, which doesn't fit into UIP pattern, which is usual interstitial pneumonitis, which is the radiological pattern of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So UIP, no etiology, is IPF. If you have an etiology, it goes into other baskets like CTD, ILD, drug-induced. Okay, similarly, NSIP, whichever it may be, you have an etiology, it will go into the CTD basket or the drug-induced basket. If you don't have an etiology, it will come into the idiopathic NSIP basket, which comes under the chronic fibrosing. That's, that's what the small i before the NSIP stands for. Then you have the smoking-related ILD. There are some ILDs were exclusively in smokers, which is the respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, probably one of the uh, most mild ILD uh, patterns where just stopping smoking will take care of the disease and the centrilobular nodules because of RBILD completely disappear with cessation of smoking in 6 to 12 months. Then you have a desquamative interstitial pneumonitis where there are uh, pigment laden macrophages which are deposited into the depths of the lung which cause ground glass opacities and nodules in the parenchyma which is also exclusively smoking related. Uh, but here, sometimes it resolves with smoking, sometimes you need a bit of treatment. Then you have the acute or subacute. So, as you, if you recall, I mentioned that you suspect ILD when you have three-month duration of cough and breathlessness. Suppose someone presents with six weeks of 
rapidly progressing cough and breathlessness. The two differentials among ILD basket, you will think, are organizing pneumonia. These are very relevant to you because they may present just like consolidation, the differential for a community acquired pneumonia is an organizing pneumonia. So you have, say, four weeks of, uh, and the features are like fever, a bit of weight loss, malay, fatigue, uh, cough and breathlessness progressive with consolidations on X-ray slash CT of non-infective origin. Okay, so there you need to think of organizing pneumonia. We will delve into it in a bit more detail when we look at the individual thing, uh, individual diseases. And then you have acute. This is very acute. You can have it over seven uh, days to one month duration. Very acutely progressive. Patients come in very sick, requiring in hypoxic respiratory failure. Uh, may need to be intubated and they have diffuse reticular nodal opacities and that is called acute interstitial pneumonia. And incidentally, that was the first described ILD by uh, Haman and Rich. So it goes by the name Haman and Rich syndrome. That is acute interstitial pneumonia. So here, you, I'm not going to delve into it in detail. So it, you give high dose steroids. No one knows whether it really <coughs> works effectively. Some do respond to it, some succumb to it, the mortality is very high, uh, uh, but that's something to keep in mind when you have a patient who's coming in with a acute, when you have a ARDS kind of picture and when you are looking at, you know, infective differentials like uh, HIV with PCP, scrub ARDS, uh, community acquired pneumonia with ARDS, secondary ARDS due to somewhere else. Uh, lymphocytic deposits usually in the lung. Very rare as an idiopathic problem. It's usually seen in children associated with HIV, uh, with lymphoma, with uh, uh, Jogren syndrome. This is where usually LIP is seen, and so it often goes in the basket of uh, CTD, ILD, but when it does not have an etiology, it would be idiopathic LIP, but it's very, very rare. The other rare entity, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but just to mention uh, up front here, is pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis. So this, unlike other ILDs, which have more of bibasal involvement, this can have biapical involvement. It is a cause of pneumothorax. You can see kind of, in, you know, like a bit of like this post, past pulmonary TB apical capping kind of picture. So there is a pleural thickening apically with interstitial abnormalities in the lung. Uh, and the response is not great to uh, treatment, which is steroids, a bit of immunosuppressant, and can progress rap rapidly and can ha have a very poor outcome. Uh, we've seen a few cases, uh, some of which we have reported as well. So again, this can be because of uh, connective tissue disease, it can be drug-induced. When it is idiopathic, it comes in IPPFE category. It can, it is also seen post, um, bone marrow or stem cell transplant in that category also it's seen where you're looking at the etiology based PPFE. Okay, there's something to be aware of. Someone presents with pneumothorax, biopical capping, uh, pleural involvement, and this is because of elastin deposition. So in the tissue you have elastin, so you have to do a lung biopsy to prove elastin if, if, the, if they are physically fit for a lung biopsy. So that completes our description of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Moving on to the ILD, ILDs with known causes or DPLDs with known causes, uh, the striking or more common one are the granulomatous DPLDs, where you have sarcoid heading the list and uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, which we will look into in a bit more detail, so I'm not going into it now. Then you have uh, DPLDs with known associations. You have several of your connective tissue diseases which have ILD the patterns and treatment we are going to delve with in the third lecture. Uh, you have drug-induced, uh, again, drug-induced causes can cause diffuse pattern. It's important to understand which drugs cause and what pattern they cause. And the best reference you can go into is pneumotox.com. So if you, if your patients are on a particular drug and you have a particular ILD pattern, you go to pneumotox.com. It has got a live record of every case report available in the literature captured into one form in drug name and pattern of involvement. Like for example, methotrexate, the commonest pattern is 
hypersensitivity pneumonitis pattern. So if you have uh, this common dilemma we have, you have a, a rheumatoid arthritis with a ILD which is progressing, patient is on methotrexate, is it rheumatoid associated ILD or is it methotrexate induced? So knowing the pattern, knowing the profile and relationship to drug given to the toxicity is important and pneumotox.com is a very good uh, website to go into to get an idea when you deal with patients. Miscellaneous one, again, I'm not going to delve into detail today because steroids are not the cornerstone of treatment there, LAM and LCH, but these are the ones which present with pneumothorax and they are both cystic lung diseases. So if you have someone presenting with pneumothorax and there are cysts in the lung, one of those two will be the differential. They have specific clinical profile where we need to suspect. We are not going into that today. Probably I'll try and touch that in the third lecture. All right, is that clear? So this picture is very important to have. Uh, this is the backbone of our understanding at, of, of both diagnosis and treatment. All right, now just to understand, this is a very crude way of understanding the processes that happen in ILD. With regards to treatment, with regards to today's talk, which is the role of steroids in ILD. So you have an inflammatory process going on and you have a fibrotic process going on. And remember, uh, inflammatory process which is untreated will lead on to fibrosis on uncontrolled self-healing. So that is why it is important to act on the inflammation with anti-inflammatory drugs ASAP to prevent established fibrosis which leaves behind permanent lung function impairment and leads to respiratory failure and so on. And if you have fibrosis and fibrosis is progressive, they don't respond to steroids and you need to put them on antifibrotics which in many cases do not arrest the progression of fibrosis but they only delay the progression of fibrosis. So we have looked into it in detail in the context of IPF in the first lecture. In the context of non-IPF, PPF which is progressive pulmonary fibrosis, we will deal with it in the third lecture. Now it is important to understand what these two mean uh, when we look at HRCT features because HRCT is the backbone of diagnosis and everything else is kind of add-on, your bowel, your TBLB, TB cryobiopsy and the final MDT decision. So in, in a HRCT, uh, I will show it to you when I show specific disease processes but to understand Inflammation or alveolitis, which is inflammation in the alveoli, is represented by ground glass opacities on a HRCT, which is like, you know, hazy appearance on the CT. And fibrosis has numerous names. You can have uh, interstitial thickening, you can have uh, septal thickening, which can be intralobar or interlobar septal thickening. You can have, when there is uh, fibrosis, there is traction bronchiectasis or traction bronchiolectasis based on the level of involvement into the bronchial tree. This is because there is fibrosis and there is pulling of the bronchiole slash bronchi on all areas. So there is dilatation. This is not the classical bronchiectasis, but it's a traction bronchiectasis secondary to fibrosis. And when they cause cystic uh, about three cystic layers, one over the other, usually found subplurally, they are called honeycombing. So, and we had radiological uh, description and you all who were attended last time went through a process of identifying how interstitial thickening appears and how honeycombing appears on a HRCT. Now, I'm going to mark some areas on this uh, diagram to say which responds and which does not respond to steroids. So as I marked in black, IPF has no role in steroids and this is uh, found, uh, when I was a PG, we used to treat all IPF with steroids. Steroids and acetyprine was the standard of care. In 2009, there was a Panther trial which used steroids, n cysteine and acetyprine and it, the trial had to be, it's an RCT uh, uh, a double blind RCT which found that there was increased mortality in the triple regimen group as compared to placebo and it had to be stopped uh, prematurely and then simultaneously in the next few years came the antifibrotics which slowed the FEC decline in IPF. 
So, uh, steroids have no role. In fact, they have detrimental effect in IPF. And when I say IPF, it's idiopathic usual interstitial pneumonitis pattern. Uh, when do you need biopsy and all that was dealt with in the first lecture. Then you have occupational lung disease, which is like uh, silicosis, pneumoconiosis, uh, the various pneumoconiosis, uh, uh, progressive massive fibrosis, and so on. So these are uh, related to silica and va various other organic exposure. And the treatment here is to stop the exposure. And what damages have happened do not respond to steroid treatment. So that's why I put that as black and LAM. LAM actually responds to calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, so we are not going, that does not respond to steroids. LCS has some role, so I've left it uh, non-black. Then there are, as I already alluded to, respiratory bronchiolitis ILD is a disease which completely responds to stopping smoking. Uh, and it's related to stopping cigarettes, cannabis, so many, it's related to several uh, exposure of smoke. Uh, and stopping smoking completely resolves this. Again, there is no role for steroids. Then you have steroid responsive DPLDs, which you see in green marked here. And the one in the dark green is the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Again, I talked to I did not talk in depth into organizing pneumonia, but I told, gave the clinical picture. But here what you have is you have intra-alveolar fibrotic plugs. Okay, these are called mason bodies. You might have heard of it somewhere. So these come and block the alveolar duct and there is distal consolidation. And when it does not have a etiology, which we discussed, it is called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. When it does have an etiology, it has got whatever, CTD associated, and it has had the name BOOP, bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia. To understanding, it's important to understand that this is different from bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a different entity, which we see in the post stem cell transplant, uh, certain other groups where there is bronchiolar inflammation and obliteration, but there is no distal consolidation. When there is distal consolidation, it is called BOOP. BOOP can be of CTD, drug-induced, inhalation-induced. When there is no etiology, idiopathic BOOP is called COP. Okay? Now, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is one disease among the ILD category, which is extremely responsive to high-dose steroids. So you can have just a massive involvement of the lung, which just melts away with steroids and you can have a normal imaging, normal symptomatology, normal PFT few months down the line. So that's why I put that as black. And everyone requires treatment, although a subset won't, I'll deal with it, deal with it when I come to the specific dis disease etiology. Then you have idiopathic NSIP where I told you the inflammatory spectrum, the cellular NSIP has response, mixed has mixed response, fibrotic has no response. DIP, I told you, it can respond to steroids, but in some time, just stopping smoking can do the job. So that's why I put it like that. Some people may not need it. LIP, again, steroids are indicated. CTD, ILD, of course. Drug in due, ILD, of course. Sarcoidus, of course. I, the reason I put these in light green is because if you look at CTD and all that, they don't completely respond to steroids, like compared to COP. But uh, diseases like sarcoid, not everyone requires steroids. They are responsive, but not everyone requires steroids. We'll come to it when we deal with sarcoidosis. And so is HP. Not everyone responds. The role of steroids are not well established as compared to other DPLDs. Now, what are the factors which affect the dose and duration of steroids? The most important factor is the diagnosis. Because as you saw, where they fall into this uh, classification determines whether they require steroids and how much they require steroids. Again, the component of inflammation on the HRCT. If the inflammation is more, they will respond to steroids more. Inflammation is less or fibrosis is more, the response will be less. The current presentation, is it acute 
versus more subacute chronic. Like in organizing pneumonia, presenting very acutely, you will require high dose of steroids. Uh, you may have to even pulse uh, patients with steroids as compared to a more subacute chronic course where you just will settle with a half mg per kg or 1 mg kg of prednisolone. Uh, then other system involvement in diseases like sarcoidosis, uh, connective tissue disease ILD, you have not only the lung involved but other systems involved. So the treatment will be dec decided, the duration and the dose will be based on other involvement. I'll, I'll delve into a bit detail into sarcoid extrapulmonary involvement to help you understand that. CTD, ILD, I'm sure you're already uh, familiar. Then comorbidities, you know, steroids have side effects. Someone who's 78, diabetic, hypertensive, uh, is not going to tolerate it that well. So sometimes that also determines what you give, how much you give, because you may go on a steroid sparing urgent earlier in those situations, again, immunosuppression, infection, those are also issues. So that brings us to the point that presence of infection is something that needs to be ruled out before initiating on steroids and immunosuppression. And diseases like organizing pneumonia are very close mimickers of infection. I'll show you an example as well, where you have consolidation going on. You don't know whether it's infection or organizing pneumonia. So often you need to do a ball or a biopsy to rule out other etiology, rule in organizing pneumonia. And the confusing thing is infection can cause OP as well. One of the etiologies of OP is infection. So just because in a biopsy you got OP, you can't jump in and give steroids. If it's an infection-driven OP, you treat the infection, the OP will resolve. And we've seen that in COVID as well. Um, so that is something to be kept in mind. And when you follow up patients, the response to treatment will decide now how much more steroid to give, how quickly to taper, and how far to give. So response to treatment also decides how much and how long you give. Again, just to uh, focus on, without an ILD, MDT, uh, things don't work well. If you have to get the best diagnosis, best outcome, both at the onset and at follow-up, it is important to have the patient run past the ILDMD. Two things are important here. It is like a machine. What you put in is what you get. So if you, to the ILDMDT, you put in inadequate information collected, what output you'll get will be dependent on that. Because no matter who sits in the MDT, the information given is important. That's why very early on, I think in 2019, we moved on to not just what someone types onto the clinical workstation at the details for, because in a busy OPD, you must, you will give sketchy information, just reading that is not enough. So if the registrar preparing the previous night doesn't sleep. So they probably finish at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning to prepare the 25 patients, one slide each, all details. So patient sometimes are on nine years of treatment, they have to enlist the entire treatment detail. For us in five, we have to make a decision in 10 minutes. It's not like uh, UK, where they, I've been in the Royal Brompton Hospital ILD unit. In a, in a day, they will, in their MDT, they'll have three patients. One patient, they'll discuss for two hours. They will go into the end of the microscopic process going on, elaborate discussion, and people like Professor Atoll Wells, who's the authority, there are people from all over the world coming to listen to how he thinks and how to understand. We don't have that luxury but we are called to give similar output in that short duration. So that preparation is important. Then we very well have realized that experience is very important. If you have a junior person with less experience there, the outputs are only commensurate with it. So we always ensure that the senior most people with ILD interest are there. So the pulmonologists lead the MDT, radiologist input is crucial, and these two form the basic, again, not any radiologist. It has to be a chest-focused radiologist with ILD interest. And we have a very good team of radiologists to come together on rotation to give us that input. So the clinical picture, radiology, and where we have a pathology input, the pathologists also need to come in. And uh, we are only beginning to do that in little increased fashion. Again, we have a very good dedicated pathologist uh, who was able to give input, and that is important to come together to give the final diagnosis. There are other people who are miscellaneous who will be good additions based on the clinical scenario. 
Now I'm going to deal in two specific disease entities and see how we can decide how much steroids to give, where and when to give and not give steroids. I'll start off with sarcoid. Most DPLDs, you have to go through this approach. You know, you cannot get away from clinical medicine. Your suspicion of the clinical problem, your examination findings are crucial to determine uh, what the diagnosis is. So you clinically suspect someone to have sarcoid. Someone is coming with fever, intermittent, loss of appetite, loss of weight, cough and breathlessness. You do an x-ray, x-ray showed bilateral hilar prominence with some reticular nodular opacities. You are clinically thinking of sarcoidosis. What do you do next? You go ahead and order a imaging. Okay, and then after the imaging, you now confirm that there is bilateral hilar adenopathy, uh, mediastinal adenopathy, there are peribronchovascular uh, nodules, which is classical of sarcoidosis. And now you look at, are there any extra pulmonary features? You know, you can have renal involvement, you can have uh, cardiac involvement, these are neuro involvement, these are quite life threatening. There is still no guideline as to whether you have to actively look for subclinical disease. As we stand today, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, but in my opinion, we having managed a lot of cardiac sarcoid. Cardiac sarcoid is the commonest cause of sudden death in sarcoid. And probably we don't see these patients back at all. Because uh, cardiac inflammation can have uh, ventricular fibrillation, uh, VTAC and cause death and these patients may never come to us. So a screening for cardiac sarcoid with the ECG and if ECG is abnormal, a halter and a <coughs> echo I think is Im very important. And if there is abnormality like antroceptal basal thinning on echo, plus or minus LV dysfunction or there is some even just a RBBB which you normally may ignore, you cannot leave it so in sarcoid. And the diagnosis to look for active inflammation is uh, secondarily a cardiac MRI, but a cardiac PET done using a cardiac protocol of uh, carbohydrate fasting with a high fat diet with heparin infusion before the procedure picks up myocardial inflammation. And if it is there, you need to address the heart and titrate your doses and response to treatment from cardiac point of view. Well, obviously neuro, skin, ocular, other things, unless really manifested, Probably a symptom sc screening is adequate uh, and if you find anything, you need to evaluate it further. So the challenges in sarcoidos, one is differentiation from other DPLDs, which you have a radiological pattern. You take the histopathology and you're reasonably, re histopathology, you do not get non-caseating granulomatous inflammation, then you're stuck, which can happen particularly in stage four sarcoid and sometimes in other stages of sarcoid as well. Then you are wondering, is it sarcoid or any other uh, DPLD? And the commonest differential is, what are the other, unfortunately I've been not, not been able to ask questions because it's going in a different fashion. What, sarcoid is upper lobe predominant or lower lobe predominant? Upper lobe. What is the other DPLD which has got upper lobe predominant? DPLDs with upper lobe predominant. Yeah, louder. RA. You know, RA is lower lobe predominant. RA is, RA, UIP is more common than NSIP. So it's lower lobe. Even NSIP is lower lobe predominant. So yeah, some uh, CTD ILDs can have uh, more, not really upper lobe predominant. They have what is called anterior upper lobe side. So you have more anterior involvement than by basal posterior kind of. Yes. But anything else? Some of the uh, exposure induced, occupational are upper lobe, uh, silicosis, pneumoconiosis and so on. So those can be differentials. Hypersensitive pneumonitis, that is a close differential from the DPLB spectrum, which is also granulomatous, although you only find ill-defined granulomas. So that becomes a differential. If you don't get hypersensitive pneumonitis, then you look at the whole profile and decide. But if you do get granulomatous inflammation, then what is the differential? Bilateral medial adenopathy, bilateral hilar adenopathy, medial adenopathy, lung nodules. Hmm? Yeah, you, tuberculosis. Yeah. So it becomes a uh, tuberculosis, and if you don't have medial adenopathy, only lung involvement, then other granulomatous disorders like GPA, granulomatous polyangitis, those become differential. So 
the, the commonest uh, ambiguity we, we find very difficult to find out is uh, sarcoidosis versus TB when you have granulomatous inflammation. So the confounding factors are 10% of, uh, 5 to 10% of sarcoid can have caseating granulomatous inflammation. So that is a bit confounder. Then the easy tools that we use to differentiate is, what do we use to differentiate? What do we use to differentiate sarcoid and TB? Louder. I have to imagine with your lip movement. What, what did you say? Cultures, yeah, but cultures don't come immediately. Yeah, if you have expert positivity, you could have. But remember, now we have a ultra sensitive expert. The current expert in our institution is ultra expert, which has got a good amount of false positivity rate. Unlike the previous era expert, where if expert is positive, you can be sure. Now, if it comes trace, rifampicin indeterminate, it may be false positive. So, adding to our confusion. Then, what else? Man 2, okay, PPD. So, uh, that is something that we commonly use, but we need to understand that is because sarcoid suppresses, uh, causes energy by uh, drawing all the lymphocytes into granuloma form formation. Uh, but it, it, in, in someone who has latent TV, it can be positive. So you, you have to keep that in mind and sometimes TB can be the inciting factor for sarcoid, both can coexist. So these are difficult dilemmas to uh, keep in mind when you are evaluating. It is not that every granulomatous inflammation with PPD positivity is only TB. So you have to look at the clinical profile and decide. Uh, then you look at the severity, what stage uh, what is the radiological staging of sarcoid called? Scadding stage, you've heard of? Scadding stage is the chest X-ray staging of sarcoid. The stage 1, 2, 3, 4, we'll briefly look at it. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then based on that, you decide, and then the lung function tells you how severe you decide on uh, treatment. So that is a uh, scadding stage. Stage 1, as you can see, is bilateral hilar prominence. Okay, you just have bilateral hilar prominence, no parenchymal involvement. And the key thing to remember here is without treatment, 70% of them resolve. So, it doesn't require treatment. Okay, unless there are lung function impairment or significant symptom. Someone is having fever, uh, gross fatigue, don't say stage 1, I won't treat you. They need treatment. Okay, then the second one is stage 2, where you have bilateral hilar prominence and parenchymal infiltrates. Again, the, about 50% of them spontaneously resolve. So here also, although the x-ray may be dramatic, but if it was incidentally detected, patient is not symptomatic, there is no need to rush to treatment, you can keep on follow-up. However, if they are symptomatic, lung function impairment, we need to treat. Grade 3 is there is no uh, hilar prominence or no adenopathy, but there is parenchymal infiltrate alone. And the re spontaneous resolution here is only 30%. So the recommendation is to treat because you don't want, uh, if you don't treat, what will happen? Our initial thing, inflammation will go on to fibrosis and then you are left with uh, impaired lung function. And stage four is called fibrotic sarcoid where it is not just active inflammation, there's a lot of fibrosis that's all already set in. So if it's only fibrosis and no active inflammation, again, there is no role for steroids. So in stage one, part of stage two and Fibrotic stage 4, no role for steroids. Part of st stage 1, very symptomatic, stage 2, symptomatic, and all stage 3 require steroids. Then based on which organ is involved, we can determine what treatment is required. So sarcoid treatment is based on each organ involvement. So you have to decide treatment of each organ, and whichever is the topmost organ requiring highest treatment, Will, will be the treatment which will take care of other organs as well. So if you have only thoracic non-steroid requiring, you don't require. Or if you have uh, dermatological involvement, which, which just suffices with uh, HCQ, or your ocular anterior uveitis alone, then uh, or joint in musculoskeletal involvement alone, you need not, uh, for these systems, you don't require steroids. Then based on other system involvement, you may have to give a modest dose, which is 0.5 mg per kg per or 1 mg per kg per And that is the rest of thoracic 
and I have labeled it as neuro A, where you have just um, neuropathy, myopathy, aseptic meningitis, uh, hepatic, abdominal, the, the routine cardiac, you know, which is not uh, like uh, recurrent, if there is a recurrent VT, persistent VT, uh, shocking but c keeps coming back, then they will go under the next category called pulse. But if the, you detected based on low LV dysfunction, or uh, abnormality on the ECG or Holter and a cardiac pet source inflammation, they'll come under the modest dose. And renal A is without uh, EGFR impairment and hypercalcemia uh, slash uh, calciuria. High dose is where neuro B, you have uh, meningeal involvement, there is uh, intraparenchymal lesion, there is a symptomatic uh, hydrocephalus. Uh, so these would come under or a vasculopathy uh, uh, in the brain you need to give high-dose steroids and uh, renal involvement with uh, renal function impairment and ocular B, which is uh, posterior uveitis or pan-uveitis, you need to give high-dose steroids. And uh, acute presentations of cardio, renal and neuro, these are the three major involvement, you, need, you may need to pulse these patients as well. So, so based on where they are involved, so I just made a flow chart to understand. So if you have only thoracic A, no treatment. If you have derm, ocular, A, and musculoskeletal, non-steroidal treatment is the first line. If you have thoracic B, neuro A, renal A, abdo, cardio, calcium disintegration, modest dose steroids, that's 0.5. Then neuro B, renal B, ocular will be high dose steroids. See, wherever high dose steroids are required, you're going to require treatment for longer term, and you require steroid sparing agents. So that's why the steroid sparing agents come in. And if you have severe or acute neurorenal thing, you need to pulse and then follow up with high dose with uh, second line. And in each of these, if it doesn't work, like you need to go to the next stage, which is low dose steroids here. Uh, methotrexate is the most studied drug as uh, steroid sparing slash uh, second line agent in sarcoid uh, across all uh, uh, organ involvement. So that's probably the preferred drug of choice. And then. The, after you, you hit that line, the next line will become TNF-alpha inhibitors like uh, infliximab, adalimab, and so on. And then, uh, you know, anti-CD20, rituximab, because there is some B-cell pathway also identified in sarcoid. And several other newer drugs are coming in if they fail uh, treatment with uh, uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors as well. But these are all required in very small proportion of patients. Most of them are quite steroid responsive. And even if they have relapse of sarcoid, which can happen in about 20 to 30 percent. Again, just steroids are enough, and if further relapses happen, steroids with methotrexate or MMF uh, would suffice, uh, unless they are steroid non-responsive, and you may have to go down to, or side effects. We've had patients with, uh, recently we had a patient with um, loss of appetite, loss of weight on steroids, and then a scopy showed a large ulcer, biopsy showed H HSV, herpes simplex. So we had to put the patient on acyclovir, stop the steroids, uh, and now we are waiting to see what happens. And then based on the cardiac, so this is a cardiac and pulmonary involvement, we may have to change course to uh, either uh, TNF-alpha or lower dose of inflammation. All of these have, uh, you know, other infections. Like if you go for TNF-alpha, you need to screen for other infections like TB, hepatitis, and so on. So that is... Uh, quick review on sarcoid treatment. I'm moving on to hypersensitive pneumonitis. So hypersensitive pneumonitis, you have an inhalational problem. You have antigens. There are more than 200 antigens described which cause inhalational injury. And when I say inhalational in injury, this is like a type 3 hypersensitivity response. You have an antigen that you're exposed to. There is an IgG response. And there is an immune complex reaction which goes and gets deposited in the peribronchoalveolar space and causes a interstitial picture. Because they involve the airway, they also cause air trapping. So they narrow the smaller alveoles, so you're going, air is going in, but it's not coming out enough, so there is air trapping that happens. So there's ground glassing, there are nodules, and there is air trapping, and radiologically it's called the head cheese site. Okay, it's like a head cheese cut. You have uh, triple morphology on radiology, which is quite diagnostic of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But often it is not possible to find the offending antigen. And it's important to understand that in the largest registry in India on hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but predominantly with patients in North India, 
the commonest antigen found in India is from air coolers. So if you have a patient you're suspecting HP, you need to ask for air cooler history. So air coolers are not, I, I mentioned this last time as well, you, air coolers are used and then when it is winter it is kept, it's not uh, dried properly and then you have uh, several fungi and several spores that are there and then you don't clean properly and use it again, you're inhaling these spores and that can cause hypersensitive pneumonitis. The other common things are like uh, pigeon droplets exposure and all that but then uh, in that way, everyone staying in hospital campus should be developing HP, but I don't think we have any case of HP from our uh, campus. So, well, we can't take it away lightly. There's probably a genetic predisposition to all this. So there's an inciting antigen, a genetic predisposition, a mix of those two reacts the lung to cause it. But clinically, how do these patients present? So earlier, hypersensitivity was, pneumonitis was divided into acute, subacute, chronic based on presentation. But that over a period in literature has been wiped out recently. The classification of HP is now fibrotic and non-fibrotic. Which means if you have fibrosis set in, it's called fibrotic. If you have only soft opacities of these HGs, like you have ground glass opacities, if you have uh, nodules and air trapping, which comes as mosaic perfusion, then you, you look at comes, they will present with episodes. So whenever they're exposed to the antigen, they will get fever, cough, breathlessness, malay kind of feature. And then they'll become all right. So it's a di close differential for asthma. So, in a, in a, so I, I deal with it this way. If a patient uh, presents to you with asthma, on examination if you have crackles, crackles don't fit into asthma. Second point, if you have an x-ray that is abnormal, more, anything more than uh, just increased bronchovascular markings, your suspicion needs to go up and you need to do an imaging which is HRCT. Again, lung function cannot show you much because air trapping and all these are features of asthma as well. So that can be one presentation. The other is chronic HP, where they have started having, which is like fibrotic HP, which is now called fibrotic HP, which presents more with uh, uh, upper lobe involvement as well as lower lobe involvement with honeycombing. It actually becomes a close differential for IPF. So you can have a patient whom you're clinically suspecting IPF, but there are some areas of air trapping with honeycombing with reticular nodules. The one good feature is IPF, IPF is a neutrophil driven process, whereas uh, HP is a lymphocyte driven process. So if you do a bowel and you have neutrophilic inflammation, you diagnose IPF. If you have lymphocytic inflammation more than 30%, you diagnose HP. But again, uh, in, in acute scenarios, this may change. Uh, there is some uh, role of CD4, CD8 ratio, which is under research in, to help in diagnosing as well. But, you know, if you're not able to conclusi conclusively decide, then you need, so you have a history, a radiological finding and a PFT and a bowel that is supportive, then you can diagnose. If it is not, then the MDT may decide to go ahead with a biopsy. There are some studies with transbronchial lung biopsy without cryo, but the yields are quite variable and low. So we don't do TBLB. We have begun to do cryobiopsy for HP, where the diagnostic yield is higher. So the other thing that's helpful, which I missed to mention, is the specific IgG. So there are specific IgG panels. See, when you have a specific IgG, that means this person is already uh, exposed to the antigen and have had IgG response, which, is, which probably persists for life. So if you are able to get a HP panel and you have IgG and a clinical picture that fits in and a radiological picture, that can be diagnostic. So a specific IgG has equal value in getting a history of an exposing antigen which can cause, uh, um, which can cause uh, HP. Look uh, at the PFT and all that on the side. So this is the current recent uh, guideline on HP. So the, this is what the current MDT goes by. So you have a HRCT picture that is typical, compatible or indeterminate. Then you have your history or IgG positivity for precipitants for antigen panel. And then you have bowel information of lymphocytosis. Then you have biopsy information which is consistent with HP. And the biopsy shows ill-defined granulomas. So these are not well-formed granulomas. And there's a lot of bronchiolocentric lymphocytic inflammation. So if you have this classical picture, then based on what you have, don't have, you can determine the confidence of your diagnosis of HP. 
So the treatment of HP is often just removal of the offending antigen, if found. But often that is not found. The role of steroids is not like greatly established like in diseases like sarcoidosis, but that is all that we have. And often you have uh, air trapping on uh, lung function and airway obstruction. Air trapping is found by uh, residual volume by tidal volume which is increased. So your RV increases compared to the total lung capacity. Well, RV by TLC ratio, I'll show you when I show in the monitoring, more than 120 is diagnostic of air trapping. So if you have air trapping, one of the drugs we know from airway disease research that acts well on air trapping is LAMA, long-acting muscarinic antagonist, which is titropium inhaler. And then also bronchodilators, there may be a doubtful role for inhaled corticosteroids. And in India, we don't have long-acting beta agonist inhaler independently. It always comes with ICS. So a lava ICS combination uh, for metrol budicinide and a titropium inhaler is one way of treating hypersensitive pneumonitis. But if you have active uh, infiltrates like ground glassing on the CT and all that, you would probably give steroids as well. Treated steroid failure have used MMF. So that may be the probable second line in treating HP. Moving on to organizing pneumonia. Is it okay if I finish by nine? Yeah. Another 10 minutes. See, organizing pneumonia, I, I've talked about it a lot in the beginning. You know the presentation, they can mimic community acquired pneumonia. Now it can be primary where there is no inciting etiology or it can be secondary. And secondary, so you need to list. So once you have a patient who has a radiological picture which is consistent with an organizing pneumonia, you have to rule out infection. I told you the interplay between infection and infection related OP like COVID, a uh, lot of viral atypical pneumonias like mycoplasma, chlamydia, all these can cause uh, infection related OP. So if you have infection and OP, you treat the infection, not the OP. Infection could, res OP could resolve on its own. Persistent OP requires treatment. And I, as I told you, we, we saw that in COVID as well. There's a lot of COVID OP which was there. Then connective tissue diseases like uh, RA, SLE, Jogren's, uh, systemic sclerosis can all have OP pattern. It can be drug induced like methotrexate, bleomycin and so on. I just listed the drugs from a recent review. Inhalational toxins can also cause. So the pathology here, as I already mentioned, there are intra-alveolar fibrotic plugs that are there. So that's a radiological picture of consolidation over there. And it's usually multifocal and symmetrical, but it can be just unifocal. That is why it confuses with pneumonia. It's like you call multifocal pneumonia, like that it can be multifocal OP, there can be unifocal OP, all that is possible. And you have to either do a CT guided biopsy or a bronchoscopy guided biopsy. This is one place where cryobiopsy may have an additional yield, but you get good diagnosis just with a routine transbronchial lung biopsy. Because there is consolidation, we get good tissue for interpretation for getting this organizing pneumonia, fibrotic plugs inside the alveoli or mason bodies. A duct histopathologically, where you have a lot of uh, inflammation and intra-alveolar, these fibrotic plugs which are there. And left alone, they will, uh, and the distal lung is all having consolidation with lot of exudation. And like any pneumonic process, if not treated, it will go on to develop fibrosis. So you have a clinical picture, a HRCT pattern that's fitting in, then important thing is to do a ball because you're going to subject them to high dose steroids. OP requires one to 1.5 milligram of prednisolone to start with. So you have to doubly sure there is no infection and often is inevitable to do a bronch. That's why often we don't do CT biopsy. Although CT biopsy can give you OP, it cannot rule out infection. So we do a ball and a TBLB, rule out infection <coughs> and rule in a uh, organizing pneumonia, make sure there is no etiology and then you are able to say with high confidence or definitivity. So no second line agent required up front. Few words on NSIP, I have already talked some bits of it uh, which is, it is a distinct entity uh, as I already alluded to radiologically and uh, histopathologically they can be cellular, fibrotic or mixed. And the top left picture is that of, you may recall from the previous talk, we 
that was a focus starting point clinical suspicion IPF. You had probable UIP or fibrotic HP. So that is what we are looking at there. You know, if you may remember, there is interstitial thickening, reticular nodular opacity, opacities, traction bronchic tesis, but there is no honeycombing. Okay, so that would be fibrotic HP. There is no alveolar exudate, no alveolitis. If you look at the two pictures on the right, you can see there is no traction bronchiectasis, no fibrosis. It's all haziness that you see, that is cellular NSIP. And the bottom picture has a lot of cellularity, but in the bottom you see some fibrosis is setting in. But though I would call this predominantly cellular. So again, in mixed, you could have predominantly cellular, predominantly fibrosis. What responds to steroids is based on the quantum of fibros uh, inflammation or alveolitis or ground glassing that is there. Now, etiological classification of NSIP is you could have it idiopathic where it comes into the IIP category or you can have it CTD related or you can have it drug induced. See, most of the, the ILD, if you have another approach mentally, you have a clinical picture, clinical suspicion, then you have a radiological pattern. Then you look at CTD, any drug induced, toxin induced. Rule that out, it becomes idiopathic. Then you see which pattern basket it falls into idiopathic. Do you need a lavage? Do you need a biopsy? And proceed. So that will be your overall approach. Approach to treatment. So once you have radiologically HP, you look at the etiology. There is a etiology, you don't require further investigation. You treat the etiology. You, you found a rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD. You treat the rheumatoid arthritis and from a lung point of view, you often require steroids and probably MMF, the preferred drug from side effect profile and CTD point of view. So steroids and MMF. If, it, if it's drug induced, again, you treat that and stop the offending agent. If you do not have, then the important question to ask is, you have fibrotic NSIP on radiology, is your clinical suspicion IPF? If your clinical suspicion is IPF, if you may recall from the previous talk, a fibrotic NSIP and clinical IPF, clinical suspicion of IPF, your final diagnosis is IPF. Am I confusing you? Clinical suspicion is IPF and fibrotic NSIP, which is equivalent to probable UIP, when your clinical suspicion is IPF, your final diagnosis is IPF. But your clinical suspicion is not, when I say clinical suspicion, I fear we dealt with it. You are looking at a 70-year-old smoker coming with cough, breathlessness, clubbing. If you have fibrotic NSIP, it is IPF. But you have a 45-year-old female coming with cough and breathlessness and you get fibrotic NSIP, that is not IPF. You need further distinguishing. So you, if that, if it's, or it is cellular pattern, mixed pattern, you need further uh, transbronchial cryobiopsy to decide what histological pattern it is. Then you have the clinical, radiological, histological. You put that into an MDT, you will get the best output. Is it actually IPF or are you dealing with a uh, fibrotic NSIP which is idiopathic? Uh, and then based on that, the treatment uh, gets decided again. Uh, progression of fibrosis is important. If you have previous imaging, Fibrosis progression, the treatment would become more of antifibrotic. Though it is idiopathic fibrotic NSIP, because it will fulfill criteria for progressive pulmonary fibrosis of non-IPF origin. But if you have a single one, there is a bit of inflammation mixed, you will give steroids, immunosuppressants, look at treatment response and then decide. Last one, desquamative interstitial pneumonia. As I, as you remember from the classification, this is a smoking related ILD. So you here, you don't get any hard infiltrates. There is no fibrosis. As you can see in the HRCT, there is only ground glassing and uh, if at all mild interlobar septal thickening, that is what it is. It's seen more in males, almost exclusively in smokers. Stopping smoking could revert, but there is significant symptoms, significant lung function impairment, significant involvement. You have to upfront start on steroids. In steroid resistant cases, macrolides have been tried. So if you look at it from a treatment approach, do I have to give steroids? How much steroids you have to give? Then this flow chart will be helpful. You have someone sitting in front of you with a confirmed ILD. Then you look at the pattern, 
etiology, and then you decide on the treatment. And for the treatment, I have divided it further here. If it's idiopathic and of UIP pattern, IPF, no steroids. If it is non-IPF, then you need to give steroids, except in few cases like RBILD, no, some bit of uh, DIP, no. Everywhere else, you have to give steroids. If it's granular matters, you have to give steroids in everyone, except a stage one sarcoid asymptomatic, stage two asymptomatic, or stage four without active inflammation. Or in some HP, which is mild, you're just treating with inhalers, you don't need to. CTD associated, yes, you have to give it along with other immunosuppression. Drug induced, again, yes. Miscellaneous is where LAM, LCH come. No, not much role of steroids. Overview on the dose of steroids and the duration of steroids. This is not like written on stone or based on, not everything is based on uh, prospective randomized studies, but this is like from consensus guidelines and kind of what we follow. I'm not going into the depths, but you know, uh, for someone like NSIP, sarcoid, uh, DIP, CTD, ILD, it's 0.5 milligram per kg steroids. If you have a cellular NSIP where the inflammation is more, but 0.6 to 0.75. MG steroids. If you have organizing pneumonia, one or more than one MG per kg steroid. That will be the broad overview. And some of them, additional immunosuppression is required. Word of caution on SSE ILD, high dose of steroids cause renal crisis in uh, systemic sclerosis. So we have to be careful. I will address that further in the next talk where I will focus on CTD ILD. Ancillary treatment is important. Steroids support to medication. I am not going into this whether you need to give calcium. Uh, bisphosphonates, there are different approaches to prevent. You have to look at treatment response. Vaccinations are important. Uh, steroid sparing medications early in those who have comorbidities uh, based on severity of disease and so on. Uh, pulmonary rehabilitation is important. All these patients have impaired pulmonary function. If you do not rehabilitate them, by the time they recover from the illness, they have caught up with deconditioning and their performance is not improving. So it's very important to simultaneously start pulmonary rehab on these patients. And our pulmonary rehab doesn't concentrate only on the respiratory system. So they give upper limb strengthening, lower limb strengthening exercises so that you overall increase the performance status of the patient. Oxygen is very important to uh, keep in mind. Someone who has exertional desaturation, that will be picked up on a walk test. And now we have a new parameter. If someone drops below 90%, we ask them to find out after how many seconds or minutes it comes back to about 90. Because the longer time you spend more than, less than 90, you are at higher risk of developing pulmonary hypertension due to pulmonary vasoconstriction due to hypoxia. So if that is found, then you have to give what is called SBOT, short burst oxygen therapy. You go to the washroom and come back, keep oxygen for 15 minutes. Okay, as opposed to someone who's got a PaO2 of less than uh, 55 or less than 60 with pulmonary hypertension. These are indications for LTOT. And when someone who is presenting with treatment naive acutely, that may be indication for long-term oxygen then. One month later when they improve, they may not need. So we call that STOT. These are all not standardized, but what we call in our department. It's called short-term oxygen therapy. You give oxygen for a month, 15 to 18 hours a day. At reassessment, if things are okay, you may stop oxygen. So SBOT, STOT, LTOT. Purely lung-related pulmonary hypertension, there's no role for pulmonary vasodilators. But in other situations like CTD, where there like scleroderma, where you can have a primary pulmonary vascular problem, those are beneficial. So not in pure ILD-related pulmonary hypertension or core pulmonary. Of course, treatment of other comorbidities, uh, you're all well aware. Monitoring of response, I'll finish in two minutes. Symptomatology, chest X-ray, exercise physiology, and HRCT, lung function. Now, few words of caution. I know some departments where they just do HRCT every visit. That is overkilling of use of radiology, and you don't do X-ray at all. If you do HRCT, it is not that you don't need to do X-ray. X-ray is very important for follow-up. If you have X-ray four years back and you don't have X-ray last two times, and patient comes with worsening, you don't know based on X-ray whether the patient. So every time you need an X-ray. Mandate worsening, you're not sure what is happening, you require a imaging. Otherwise, I, I know even in my department, a lot of people, sarcoid, a uh, lot of infiltrates, next time you order a HRCT up front. Absolutely, I strongly disagree with that. You are unnecessarily giving radiation and you are uh, not getting useful inflammation. If the X-ray is improving, patient is improving, lung function is improving, what is your HRCT or your CT going to give? Nothing at all. So 
be cautious of that. So, this, this entire profile is from a patient. That patient was diagnosed to have NSIP OP overlap. So, that brings me to a point. Uh, although I talked about each of these as distinct entities and pattern, there can be overlaps. So, there can be NSIP HP overlap, HP OP overlap, NSIP OP overlap, UIP OP overlap, and so on. So, uh, it's not possible in this time to go into the lengths of those things, but just something to be aware. So, this patient had a NSIP OP overlap and was started on steroids alone. And that uh, had wor initially improved and then worsened and came back. X-ray not showing much clearly as you can see here. And that's a lung function. Sorry, this is our Ranipet format. It's a bit dif different, so pardon me on that. But what we are concentrating is the FEC. And don't go by this often. Unless you have a standardized lab which always uses the same reference equations, your percentage predicted will change. There are two ways of looking at lung function. One is absolute change. One is relative change. Okay, absolute change actually looks at the percentage drop. Unless you have the same prediction equations used, that's going to be tough. But the definition of progressive pulmonary fibrosis is dependent on that. Okay, I won't go into that. So here, if you look at a relative decline, that's 1.74. It has become 1.63. So it is 1.74 minus, sorry, uh, minus 1.63 divided by 1.74 will give you the percentage drop in FEC. So FEC drop of more than 10% is called a significant relative decline in FEC. And similarly, you have DLCO, uh, 78%. Then you have a DLCO here, which is 64%. There is a drop. You can either go by this or this absolute value. Again, you use the same formula Current minus pre divided by pre into 100, you get a relative decline. A DLC of more than 15% drops, relative drop tells you that there is significant decline in the diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. The other parameter is TLC where these uh, percentages are not clearly defined. That 60% to 56% here. So you know the patient had initial improvement, but there was subsequent worsening and your x-ray didn't contribute much, but the lung function has significantly dropped. So you look at exercise walk test. So what all do we look in exercise walk test? The starting saturation, then the ending saturation. You know the base, you got the baseline there, how much it dropped by three or more percent desaturation is significant drop. Then you have the distance walk. You know, sometimes it's same amount of drop, but patient has walked less. Look at this. This patient has walked lesser now, but similar desaturation. That means patient has become worse. If you walk less and desaturate same, so that is why we use a improvised product called the distance saturation product. This is a product of the lowest saturation and the distance walk. And you can say that that is declined. 331 to 312. That is a significant drop in the DSP. Then a patient's weight has an impact on how much they can do. So there's a walk work product and a walk work desaturation product these are still in research phase but i'm sure eventually these will come into monitoring as well because on steroids patient can put on weight and you're not really taking care of that so by this you know patient has walked less but desaturated similar overall you know there is a decline no this is the same patient i'm talking about then we have this hrct this patient had op pattern here nsip op overlap and would you agree with me? The density of this and the extent has slightly worsened. It's very important to have the same cut. You know, this is just above the carina as a right main bronchus, right main bronchus dividing, and you're able to get a glimpse of the upper lobe bronchus there. If you have two different places, you can misinterpret. So this is what the radiologist put it side by side and give it to us to have a look. And we say, oh, there is a worsening. Now, what is worsened? Is, is it OP that is worsened? Or is it an infection that is set in? <coughs> this, this I took from MDT that happened Saturday. So the, the, the plan of the MDT was to do a bronchoscopy to rule out infection. If an infection is ruled out, add on second line drug, a second line immunosuppression. So immunosuppression probably have to be included. That's my last slide to conclude to say that is DPLD. The black is where you don't have a role for steroids. The Orange is where you have a role for steroid, but it's not going to benefit much. 
the light green is where they are steroid responsive but not in all cases and not steroids alone and the cop is what is most steroid responsive and if we have this idea and uh, start these patients adequately on time then steroids though not an answer for all ILDs but they are the cornerstone for a subset or subtypes of them and when chosen for the right patient at the right point time in the right dose for the right duration with appropriate monitoring they result in complete or partial reversal of ILD. You know who said that? We just said it. So, okay. right. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. I know it's not an easy topic. Uh, I've tried to explain it as much as possible but unless you have practical exposure, uh, it doesn't flow the way. So, uh, I, I don't know, when you come for peripherals, there is twice a week MDT happening. I, my suggestion is don't get caught in your word work. May, make sure those two hours you spend in our MDT. Then you'll understand how this practically unfolds. It's all through virtual, through Teams. You can log in from anywhere and you will gain a lot by attending those and you'll know when, what, how to go. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, knowing the right thing and giving the right thing will benefit our patients. Uh, and ILD MDT is really a boon. We started in 2018. Before that, we, we, it was like ILD MDT, a lot of places like this. You call the radiologist, ah, is it like this, like that, ah, and you decide. Well, that is okay, but that's not the best. Right, any questions? Or if you're hungry, probably no questions will come. Any questions? Hey, something? How often do we monitor them? Oh yeah, excellent questions. When I went to monitoring, I didn't say how often. Uh, so monitoring is every three months. Okay, but if you are in a quiescent phase, patient has come back to you in three months, very good response, six months is okay. So three to six months is when you have to monitor these patients. Uh, and in a particular fashion that you don't overdo it nor underdo and uh, miss things. Well, that's a good question. Uh, the, the exact uh, opening of that it will come in my third lecture. Uh, but if you have both and if the patient is treatment naive, you give only steroids and immunosuppressants. Because unless you, so you have an inflammatory process and the fibrosis there may be a result of untreated inflammatory process. In which case, if you treat the inflammation, often what happens, inflammation resolves, fibrosis remains stable. And remember, once you start someone on antifibrotic is for life. And the cost is 5,000 a month, and it's got side effects of 30% diarrhea, in inditinib, skin photosensitivity, and a significant proportion of perfinidone, and so on. So uh, I am very cautious. I mean, there are a lot of people who have very low threshold, particularly in UK, US, for giving. But uh, I wouldn't agree with them. You, you carefully watch. If you establish progression of fibrosis, I would jump in. I mean, I, I understand the case is slightly different in IPF, where yeah, IPF is a progressive disease. But, my question is, how sure are you on your diagnosis of IPS? So if it is a fibrotic NSIP, which may remain quiescent, so inflammation, anti-inflammatory, on, on uh, follow-up, if inflammation is coming down, fibrosis is going up, yes. And we do have evidence from census one, census two trials that uh, adding anti-fibrotics on top of anti-inflammatory does help compared to anti-inflammatory alone on RCTs. So it's not that when you give antifibrotic, you have to stop your anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory to control, on, control your inflammation, antifibrotic to slow the progression of fibrosis is acceptable, in, but in the appropriate subset. Yeah.
question is in stage 1 and 2 there is hyla retinopathy stage 3 there is no hyla retinopathy so how do you uh, i'm not sure whether your question is how do you suspect or how do you arrive at well arriving at is easy you have a bilateral diffuse infiltrates you do a biopsy it's come as granulomatous inflammation your differentials are tb sarcoid uh, granulomatous polyangitis and other granulomatous disorders if your clinical picture is fitting into sarcoid you're looking at uh, constitutional symptoms and respiratory symptoms together and there is no other organ involvement now it could be lung limited vasculitis tb and sarcoidosis now well, I don't want to really give strong importance to ACE because it's non-specific and I don't rely too much on it. But, you know, ACE is not going to be ele elevated in vasculitis. It could be elevated in TB and in sarcoid. And the distribution of radiological presentation is important. If you look at vasculitis, they are larger nodules, uh, can be consolidations, ground glass opacities, alveolar hemorrhage, that kind of picture. That is quite distinct from radiology of sarcoid where you have peribronchovascular uh, nodules. So, uh, if you have peribronchovascular nodules, interlobar, uh, inter, uh, interlobar nodules, uh, nodules along the lymph distribution, then the radiological picture is consistent with sarcoid. In fact, that is quite distinct. If you look at parenchyma, it can be quite distinct from TB, where you have tree in bud opacities, cavity and all that is TB. So, it's a radiological differentiation and a, a granulomatous inflammation proof and absence of expert. See, once you have a lot of parenchymal opacity and you've done a bronch, ball and a TBLB, uh, uh, a CBNAT being negative in a ball and a tissue in a parenchymally obvious TB is very low. And then you have PPD also to come in. And then you have ILD and experienced people to put it all, ILD, MDT, to put it all together to decide on what it is. Yeah, it's a challenge. That's like for any other uh, clinical uh, problem. But understanding the various aspects are important. There are some promising biomarkers which are coming, which are being studied, both exhaled biomarkers and blood biomarkers. So, yes, down the line, we'll have a little more better approach in differentiating these diseases. Okay, thank you.